Heavenly Father, thanks for today. Thank you for your word, for your promises, for your love, and for the salvation that is brought to us by your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the, for the privilege of studying what you say and speak. We ask you to bless us now as we study together, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right now, both in worship and in ABC, we're in the series that is called Christmas Time, and uh, we are looking quite literally at the different times of Christmas. Uh, we are channeling the old Charles Dickens classic uh, called A Christmas Carol, where Ebenezer Scrooge, who is a miserly and greedy old man, is visited by three ghosts one night. The first is the ghost of Christmas past, which shows Scrooge uh, a time when he had less money but more joy because his life was not all about his money. Uh, the second is the ghost of Christmas present, which shows Scrooge some of the needs around him that he has turned a blind eye to because he has been so concerned about himself and his own well-being. And then the third ghost that visits him is the ghost of Christmas future, which shows Scrooge that ultimately all of his money and all of his wealth, all of the stuff that he has, is not going to matter. Uh, he's going to die just like everybody else, and no one is going to care that he has died because he didn't care about anybody when he was living. And so he gets this big picture perspective on time, past, present, and future. And uh, in the story, that big picture perspective kind of shakes him up. and makes him realize that he really hasn't been living for anything because he's just been living for himself. And so by the end of the story, Scrooge goes from being miserly to gregarious. He goes from being greedy to generous, all because he got a different perspective on Christmas time. And that's what this series is all about, because sometimes during the hustle and the bustle of the season, we, like Scrooge, can lose our perspectives. We can become so obsessed with just getting to the next thing that, that we forget about what really counts in life, what really matters not only during this season, but every season, the timeless stuff that has little to do with the schedule that we keep or the money that we have. And so the series is devoted to putting a little bit of perspective back into the season by looking at Christmas time, Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. And so last weekend we took a look at Christmas past, and now even if we can't go back and redo our pasts, maybe you're here this morning and you got some regrets about some stuff that has happened in your past, our pasts can still be redeemed by God. No matter the bad stuff that has happened in our pasts, our present and our future can be great with Jesus Christ. Now, this weekend we're going to be talking about Christmas presents and how to deal with the stuff that is right in front of our faces this season. And so I was thinking about this. Have you ever noticed that with all the things that happen around us this time of year, that this time of year can get a little bit stressful? Anybody in here ever experienced stress during the holiday season? Uh, Think Finance did a survey a few years ago, and they found out that 45% of Americans would be happier if they could just skip Christmas altogether, because for them, they think that Christmas is just too stressful. Another survey from Consumer Reports, 90% of Americans stress about at least one aspect of the holiday season because they have so many different things to do. In fact, uh, the Consumer Reports survey, they broke this down a little bit, and they found out what people stress about. 68% of people stress about the crowds and long lines that they have to wait in. That is why when I do my my shopping, I point and I click because I don't like either one of those things. 37% uh, of people, they stress about gaining weight because the food this year is so delicious. Another 37% of people stress about getting into debt. They have all these presents they want to buy, but they don't quite have the money to buy them all, so they put it on credit, they get into debt, and things get stressful. 28% of people stress about gift shopping. They're worried about finding just the right gift for just the right person. 25% of people worry about traveling. Yeah, you got to hit the road, you got to hop on an airplane. Uh, that can be a very stressful experience. 24% of people stress about seeing certain relatives. Yeah. You got to go over to so-and-so's house, and you don't really want to go over to so-and-so's house. That becomes kind of a stressful situation. 23% uh, of people get stressed out over seasonal music. Now, I don't know what that's about. I would maybe assume that maybe the music sounds so great and sometimes Christmas doesn't feel that great. 19% stress out about disappointing gifts. 
okay? They're worried that either they're going to get a bad gift or they're going to give a bad gift. My favorite one, or actually my second to favorite one, 16% stress out about attending holiday parties, and then here's the good one, 15% of people stress out about having to be nice <laughs> over the holiday season. Apparently, even putting on a smile is too much for some people. Now, of course, it's not just stress that people experience during the holidays that is bad. There are other side effects the holiday season can have on people. This is from the American Psychological Association. 68% of people, they experience fatigue during the holiday season. 52% of people experience irritability during the holiday season. They're not very fun to be around. This one is sad. 36% of people experience sadness. And then this one, 28% of people, I'm not making this up, experience bloating during the holiday season. Let me explain this to you, okay? That's called fruitcake. Just stay away. <laughs> and you'll feel better. You know, there are a lot of things that can really drain us and challenge us over the holiday season. Now, it's this that takes us to our text for today because um, this kind of stress, this kind of drain, this kind of challenge is nothing new. Because stress has been baked right into Christmas from the very first Christmas. The very first Christmas was, in fact, incredibly stressful. There was a lot to deal with that was right in front of people's noses. There was a lot to try to deal with in the present. And so, take a look in Luke chapter 1, that's where we're going to be today. If you've got a Bible, open it there. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 26. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. You know, one of the things that I like about this story is how well Luke sets this up in the first two verses, really in just one sentence. Because one of the old rules about news reporting is that you always want to learn some basic things first, right? Who, what, when, where, and why. And Luke, in the very first sentence of the story, gives us all of that information. So let's start with the who. This story is about a girl named Mary. We know her as the mother of Jesus, but right out of the gate, even before Luke gives us that information, this story is primarily a story about a young girl named Mary. You move to the what. This story is a story about an angelic encounter. There is this angel named Gabriel who comes to the who of this story. Her name is Mary, and the two of them are going to have a conversation. The when of this story. It is in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now, Elizabeth is a relative of Mary, and uh, here's what you need to understand about the when. It is kind of strange that you would mark a story using somebody else's pregnancy. And so keep that in mind because there's a reason that Luke does this. There's a reason that he sets up the story, the win of the story, using the sixth month of somebody else's pregnancy. The where of the story is a town called Nazareth. And here's what I want you to notice about this. Okay? Luke not only has to give us the name of the town, he also has to give us the name of the province in which the town is located. Verse 26 says that God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee. Now there's a reason for this. Even in the ancient world, not a whole lot of people knew where Nazareth was. It was one of those backwater towns that you had only heard of if you happened to be around those parts. It's kind of like if I was to tell you I'm going to go to Paris for a vacation, you would ask me, what are you going to go see? Going to go see the Eiffel Tower? Going to go see the Arc de Triomphe? Going to go see some of the great cathedrals? But then if I clarify and I say, I'm going to go to Paris, Texas for vacation, all of a sudden the questions become different like why right <laughs> okay that's like Nazareth by the way I like Paris Texas just to clarify that okay but it's a down hometown there's no major cosmopolitan edge to it it's not a major metropolitan area and so Luke has to tell us not only the name of the town but where the town is located because even in that day most people would not know where Nazareth was now the only question that we're left with is the why and actually, this is the only question that Luke does not answer in the first sentence, at least not directly. But he does say in verse 27 that Mary's fiancé, Joseph, is a descendant of David. 
Now, the reason this is important is because this, again, isn't something that you would normally mention unless the story that was getting ready to unfold had something to do with the fact that Joseph, Mary's fiancé, was a descendant of David. And in fact, this story does have something to do with that, so keep that in mind. That's a little tease as to the why of this story. Now, there's one more thing that I want to mention here before we keep going, okay? The very fact that Luke is so matter-of-fact about the way that he introduces this story is an important fact in and of itself. Because so often, here's the way we think of the Christmas story. We think of it sentimentally, right? There's Joseph, and there's Mary, and there's a beautiful stable scene, and we got some cattle that are lowing, and the baby may wake, but he doesn't make any crying, right? And everything is bathed in nice, soft, indirect lighting, and it just feels very warm and inviting, right? But here's the problem with the way that that is painted. When you paint it so sentimentally, it almost takes on a legendary feel. But Luke doesn't paint it that way. Luke just gives us the basic and brute and bare facts right out of the gate. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why. Because for Luke, this isn't a sentimental story. This is a real story. This isn't a legendary story. This is a new story. And so maybe you're here this morning or maybe you know somebody who has questions about the historical veracity of the Christmas story. I know a lot of people are kind of tempted to think, well, this is a nice legend. It's a nice fable, but it really isn't true. If you think that, then know this. That's not what Luke thinks of the Christmas story. Because Luke sets it up with just some real basic newsy facts right out of the gate when he tells the story. He doesn't set it up sentimentally. In fact, the whole gospel of Luke is really set up in this way. Luke prides himself on being a good investigative reporter. If you go back to the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, very beginning, Luke 1, verse 1, Luke says this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too have decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus is the receiver of the Gospel of Luke. He's the guy that, that Luke is writing for. So that you too may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And so Luke writes this Gospel, and from the very beginning he says, Hey, I've done some homework. I've researched, I've investigated, I have interviewed, Luke says in verse 2, lots of eyewitnesses. And the plural here is important because Luke doesn't just get his information from one source. Luke gets his information for his gospel from lots of sources. And that's another good rule of news reporting. Because if you're going to try to figure out what happened in a story, you've got to cross-check your references, right? And so if one eyewitness says one thing and another eyewitness says another thing, you've got to figure out how those two things go together if those two things seem to contradict and conflict. Luke says, I've done that. I have tried with everything in me to get to the bottom so that I can give you the straight skinny on what Jesus was all about and what Jesus has done for us and for our salvation. And so Luke writes very matter-of-factly about the story that we're getting ready to take a look at today. And so the story continues, Luke 1, verse 28. There's this angel, and there's Mary, and the angel goes to Mary, and he says to Mary, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. This angel comes to a girl named Mary, and the angel says to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. And then he says, The Lord is with you. Now, on its face, this sounds like kind of a pleasant greeting, right? Sounds like a friendly and comforting greeting. And yet, notice Mary's reaction to this nice greeting. The angel says, Ah, oh, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. And verse 29 says that Mary is greatly troubled. Mary freaks out because of this greeting. Why? Let me give you two reasons. Reason number one, an angel is talking to her. Okay? If an angel comes and talks to you, my guess is you'd be a little freaked out too. If an angel came and talked to me, I would definitely be freaked out. So just the strangeness of the situation freaks her out. She's greatly troubled. But the other reason that this greeting freaks her out is because it's not as warm and fuzzy as it first might appear. The angel says to Mary, hey, the Lord 
is with you. Now, here's the fascinating thing about that statement. A lot of times, if you go back and read the Old Testament, when somebody says the Lord is with you, that usually is an introduction to this. The Lord is getting ready to challenge you. In Judges 6, an angel of the Lord appears to a judge in Israel named Gideon. And here is how the angel introduces to himself to Gideon. Judges 6, verse 12, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Very similar to Mary's greeting. And then the angel of the Lord says, hey, um, I need you to go fight a battle. Hundreds of thousands of an enemy called the Midianites, and I need you to fight that battle not with 32,000 men, not with 10,000 men, not with 7,700 men, but with 300 men. 300 men to defeat hundreds of thousands of men. You up for the challenge, Gideon? And oh yeah, by the way, the Lord is with you. That doesn't sound comforting. That sounds frightening. And Mary knows these kinds of stories. Mary knows that God could be fixing to take her on one wild ride. After all, she's talking to an angel who's just said to her, the Lord is with you. Now, here's what I like about Mary. Mary, even though she knows she's getting this very strange greeting, and she knows it could lead her into a lot of trouble, she is not only troubled, she's also filled with wonder. Verse 29 says that Mary wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Uh, Greek word for wondered is the word dia logizomai. And uh, the prefix there, dia, it's a preposition that means through. And then logizomai, we get our English word logic from this. It means to think about something logically. And so here's what Mary does. She not only worries about this greeting, she's not only freaked out about this greeting, she begins to think through this greeting. And here's the reason this is so important. One of the things that can happen when you're freaked out, one of the things that can happen when you get really worried is that you can lose your ability to dialogizomai. You can lose your ability to think through things well. Sometimes worry can paralyze your thinking, right? I don't know how many times I've been talking with somebody who's facing like a big worry and they're concerned about something. And so I try to give them options. Well, have you thought about this? And have you thought about that? Have you thought about this? And have you thought about that thing over there? And here's the only response I ever get back. Oh, that'll never work. And that'll never work. And that'll never work. And that'll never work. Doesn't matter how you try to help them out. Nothing is going to work. Nothing is going to make anything better. Because they have logic themselves into a corner. And so it's paralyzed their thinking. They don't see any way out of their trouble, even though in reality there may be many ways out of their trouble. Worry can do that. It can sometimes paralyze your thinking. It doesn't do that with Mary. For other people, worry just breeds more worry. They begin to play connect the dots in their mind. Well, if this thing might happen, then that thing might happen. And if that thing might happen, then that thing might happen. And if that thing might happen, then that thing might happen. And all of a sudden, rather than having one thing to be worried about, they have about 56 things to be worried about because they've connected all of the dots. And it begins to cloud their thinking. Doesn't do that with Mary. Still, for other people, worry increases bitterness. Because they're concerned about something, they're worried about something, and nobody else around them seems to be worried. And they wonder why everybody else isn't freaked out too, just like they are. And they think they've gotten the raw end of the deal, they think that they've gotten the short end of the stick, and worry has clouded their thinking. Doesn't do that for Mary either. You see, what I love about Mary is that she doesn't let her worry cloud her thinking. She actually puts her worry to work. She's freaked out, she's troubled. But then immediately she begins to wonder. She begins to dialogizomize. She begins to go, what could this mean for me and for how God is going to use me? If I can encourage you here for just a moment, if you're facing something that is daunting, and if you're worried about it, don't forget to dialogizomize. Don't just get emotional. Don't just get freaked out. Do your best to really begin to think through it. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Go and talk to some people who you trust and who you love, who will give you good and wise advice. Do everything that you can to think well, even in the middle of a stressful situation. Now, as it turns out, this angel immediately tries to calm Mary's worries. Luke 1, verse 30, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. 
The angel says to Mary in verse 30 that she has found favor with God. Pastor mentioned this in his message. The Greek word for favor is literally the word for grace in the New Testament. The angel says to Mary, you have found grace with God. Now this isn't the first time the angel says this to her. This angel's big on grace. If you go up a couple of verses to verse 28, when the angel says, greetings, Mary, you who are highly favored. The Greek word again there for favor is the word for grace. In fact, if you grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition, here's how this verse is translated. Hail Mary, full of grace. Now, the problem with the Roman Catholic tradition is this. They look at Mary as someone who has gotten grace because she has deserved grace and she can give grace to us. Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church puts it like this. By her manifold intercession, Mary continues to bring to us the gifts of eternal salvation. That's why you say, Hail Mary, full of grace, during the rosary, you're asking Mary for grace. But Luke 1 tells us that Mary doesn't give grace, it's that Mary gets grace. She gets grace from God. She gets grace from God to face her trials. She gets grace from God to endure her suffering. She gets grace from God to make it through her stress. Mary gets grace. That's what she does. She gets it from God. The angel announces it. That's why she says, you are highly favored. You have gotten grace from God. Not because you're so great, but because God is so great. Now again, this is important because this doesn't just happen with Mary. This happens with us too. Grace is one of the things that we need, too, to make it through stressful and difficult and challenging situations. Because if we do not have grace from God, if we do not have favor from God, if we do not have love from God, we're going to fall flat on our faces. There's this one time where the Apostle Paul is going through a really tough time. And although we don't know what the tough time was, Paul compares it to a thorn in his side. And he's complaining to God. And he's asking God to take away the thorn in his side. And you know how God responds? 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. God says to Paul, I may not take away your tough situations, but I'll give you grace to make it through the tough situations. I may not take away your stress, your hurt, your worry, your concern, but I'll give you grace to make it through all of that. That's what God did for Paul. That's what God is doing for Mary. I'll give you grace. You're going to be full of grace, Mary. Yeah, this is going to be a challenge. Yeah, this is going to be difficult. Yeah, this is going to be scary. But my grace will see you through. And so now here's the challenge that the angel announces to Mary. Luke 1, verse 31. The angel says, you're going to conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom is never going to end. Now it's here where things begin to get really tough for Mary, and it's here that Luke's introduction to this story begins to come home to roost. Because remember the the win of Luke's story. Luke says in verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, an angel came to Mary. And now all of a sudden we realize and understand why Luke would put this story in the context of a pregnancy from one of Mary's relatives. It's because this story, too, is about a pregnancy. In fact, the story of Elizabeth's pregnancy is a miraculous story because Elizabeth, when she gets pregnant, she is way past the age where she should be able to have children. She is collecting social security. She is retired. She's having a great time. And all of a sudden, she winds up pregnant. Well, just like it's miraculous for Elizabeth, this is going to be miraculous for Mary. Because Mary is going to have a miraculous child. Verse 32, the angel says, The Lord God is going to give this child, your child, Mary, the throne of his father, David. Last week in an ABC, I talked about how one of the great hopes for the Jews of the first century was that one day God was going to send a Savior. One day God was going to send a Messiah to Israel who was going to get rid of the wickedness that surrounded them and defeat the nations who oppressed them. And so the Jews got this idea from passages in the Old Testament like Jeremiah 23, 
where it says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'm going to raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who's going to reign wisely, do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah is going to be saved and Israel is going to live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteous Savior. And so the prophet Jeremiah says that one day there's going to come a Savior. A Savior from the line, from the house of David who is going to lead Israel into righteousness, this is going to be his name, the Lord, our Savior. Now here's Mary, and all of a sudden, she's having a son. Who is this son? He's a descendant of David. What is this son's name? You guys know it's the name Jesus. You know what Jesus means? The Lord, our Savior. That's what it means. In other words, this angel is coming to this girl... And he's saying to this girl, hey, Jeremiah 23, verse 6, that's going to be fulfilled through you. The Savior the whole world has been waiting for and watching for and hoping for. The Messiah that Israel has been looking for, the son of David, who's going to be named the Lord our Savior. You're going to have a son. He's going to be named the Lord our Savior. He's going to be named Jesus. He's going to be a son of David. And then verse 32, the angel says, he's also going to be the son of of the Most High. And this phrase, the Most High, this is a euphemism for God. And so here's who this boy is. He's a son of David and he is the Son of God. In other words, Jesus won't just come from a human, he's going to come from the divine. Jesus isn't just going to be from earth, he's also going to be from heaven. Jesus isn't just going to be a man, a son of David. He's also going to be God, the Son of the Most High. Last week in an ABC, we were taking a look at the genealogy in Matthew. And Matthew has this big list of names at the beginning of his gospel. And one of the things that I mentioned is that even though most people, when they read the gospel of Matthew, uh, they only see one genealogy at the beginning of the gospel of Matthew. There are actually two genealogies at the beginning of the gospel of Matthew. The first one begins in Matthew 1 verse 1 where it says this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. Just like the angel says to Mary. You're going to have a son. He's going to be a son of David. But then Matthew gives us another genealogy if you read ahead. Matthew 1 verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. When Matthew says in verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. The Greek word for birth there is the word genesis. It is the Greek word for genealogy. It's the same word that Matthew uses in Matthew 1 verse 1 when he calls Jesus a son of David. And so in Matthew 1 verse 1, Matthew calls Jesus the son of David. In Matthew 1 verse 18, Matthew calls Jesus the son who has come by means of the Holy Spirit, the son of God. And so Matthew's given us two genealogies because Jesus has two family trees. He has a human one and he has a divine one. Why? Because he's not just a human. He's also divine. He's not just a man. He's also God. And what Matthew does in Matthew 1 is the same thing that Luke does in Luke 1. Jesus is a son of David. He's a descendant of David, but he's also the son of the Most High. He's also the son of God. He is God. And so here's this magnificent announcement that this angel has made to Mary. Now, how does Mary respond and react to this? Verse 34 of Luke 1, Mary says, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And I was thinking about this. If an angel came to me and told me that I was going to be part of a history-altering event, if an angel came to me and told me that I had been chosen by God to raise the Son of God, I may, I might be tempted to become a little bit proud. After I was scared, I may become a little bit proud. I might be tempted to say, oh wow, please tell me more. Please go on about how God has chosen me to do this for him. Good choice, by the way. You know, that's a real good choice. But Mary doesn't do that. Mary doesn't get proud at all. Here's what Mary gets. Mary gets curious. Verse 34, she asks, how will this be? Since I am a virgin. 
You know, Pastor mentioned this in his message too. One of the objections that a lot of people have about the Christmas story is that it involves a virgin who gives birth to a baby. And a lot of people, when they read the Christmas story, they think, well, yeah, that's a bit of mythologizing. I mean, people back then, they were pre-rational, pre-scientific, pre-enlightenment. They didn't have sex ed in sixth grade. They didn't really know where babies came from. They thought they came from the stork, right? But now we know we're enlightened, we're rational, we're scientific. We understand how all this works. We understand that babies cannot come from virgins. We understand that virgins cannot get pregnant and they cannot give birth. This is from one of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson puts the virgin birth like this. The day is going to come when the mystical generation of Jesus, by the supreme being as his father and the womb of a virgin, is going to be classed with other fables of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. Here's what Thomas Jefferson is saying. He's saying, you know what, there are all these other mythological stories out there about Greek and Roman gods. And you know what, they had virgins who gave birth just like Jesus was born of a virgin. And so all Christianity is doing is they're reaching back to this pre-rational, pre-enlightenment, pre-scientific mindset, and they're ripping off old Greek and Roman mythologies. For example, ever heard of the story of Alexander the Great? Supposedly, Alexander the Great was born of a virgin. Here's the way it worked, okay? Zeus, who was kind of the chief of the Greek pantheon of gods, he took on the form of a serpent, and he snuck into the bed of Olympus, who was the wife of Philip of Macedon, and Zeus impregnated her by sleeping with her. And then Alexander the Great, who conquered the whole world, was born. But here's the thing. That technically is not a virgin birth. That is technically a God not being able to control his libido. In fact, here's the other thing about Zeus that's kind of interesting. Zeus apparently liked earthly women and went after a lot of them. He had a wife, a goddess named Hera, and she and Zeus got into it a lot because Zeus had a problem with the ladies. Now, you guys tell me, does that sound anything like the story of the virgin birth in Luke chapter 1? Yes or no? No. No. You see, Zeus, he's crass and carnal. He's going after the ladies. They may be interesting births. They may even have a twinge of divinity to them, but they're completely different than the story that we have here. Zeus gives us instances of crassness and carnality. Luke chapter 1 gives us an instance of mystery. And so here's what you need to know about these ancient mythological stories. They're, they're completely unlike the story that we see in the Bible. I will also say this, um, people in the ancient world were not dumb. They knew where babies came from. This is why when the angel visits Mary and the angel says to her, you're going to get pregnant with the Messiah, the Son of God, the very first question that Mary asks is this, how will this be since I am a virgin? Most scholars think that Mary wasn't much older than 14 years old when the angel came to her. And so she was young, and she already knew where babies came from. In fact, I find it fascinating that the very first person to doubt the virgin birth in history was the virgin who was getting ready to give birth, okay? Because she knows where babies come from, and they don't come from storks. There's this guy named Celsus. He was a second century Greek philosopher. And he, too, said there was no way that a virgin could get pregnant. He said that it was actually a Roman soldier. Mary had an illicit affair with, and that's how she became pregnant. Church father named Origen came along about a century later and said, no, that's not how Mary got pregnant. You see, people have been denying the virgin birth for a long time, and Christians have been defending the virgin birth for a long time. Even the virgin who gave birth knew that this was strange. Even the virgin who gave birth knew that this was scientifically and biologically impossible. But just because something is scientifically and biologically impossible does not mean that it is divinely impossible. It's part of the point of this story. What is impossible with man is quite possible with God. Luke 1, verse 35, the angel gives to Mary a little bit more information about her question. The angel answers, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you, and the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born to you is going to be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who wasn't able to conceive is in her sixth month. 
And then the angel says, for no word from God will ever fail. The angel says to Mary, this child of yours, for all intents and purposes, is going, to be devo- is going to be born by divine fiat. Yeah, you may be a virgin, but you're going to get pregnant. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. And then notice, notice how this angel follows up his message to Mary. He says, hey, look at your relative Elizabeth, verse 36. Even she is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. And so here's what the angel does. The angel says, God's going to do a miracle in your life. That's what the angel says to Mary. And then the angel follows that up by saying, and and just in case you have any questions about that, just in case you have any doubts about that, just look at this miracle that God has done over here in somebody else's life. Just look at this miracle that God has done over here in Elizabeth's life. If God can help a lady who is way past the age of childbearing get pregnant, then God can help you get pregnant too, even though you're a virgin. Now part of the reason that I like this so much is because this right here is really kind of a recipe for dealing with our own doubts. Because here's what the angel does. The angel says, okay, if you've got a doubt about this, look over here at something that you can empirically verify. Look over here at something that you can test. If God can do this and you can test it and you can see it, then maybe God can do the thing that you think he can't do too. And so, if you have doubts about the Bible, here's one of the things you can do. You can empirically test some things about the Bible. And you can figure out whether or not those things about the Bible are true. For example, does the Bible tell the truth about us anthropologically as human beings? Here's what the Bible says about human beings. The Bible says that human beings struggle with bad things. There are good things that we want to do, but instead of doing the good things that we want to do, it's the bad stuff that we don't want to do. That's the stuff that we wind up doing. That's what the Bible says about human beings. Can you test that empirically? Can you verify that you have done bad things even though you'd like to do good things? Can anybody empirically verify that? Okay? If somebody can empirically verify that for themselves, just ask the person next to you to empirically verify that. They'll say, oh, of course you do all sorts of bad things, right? You can test the Bible and you can say, it is true, anthropologically. You can also test the Bible and ask, is it true historically? Can I go back and check other sources, outside sources, that show there really was a Roman emperor named Caesar Augustus and and there really were Roman emperors who took censuses that demanded that everybody go back to their hometown to be registered? Yes, we have other sources that talk about that. Can you prove or can you test that Pontius Pilate really existed according to outside sources? Yes. Can you test that Herod the Great really existed and really was called the king of the Jews? Yes. And so if the Bible's description of this stuff, if this historical stuff is true, and if the Bible's description of anthropological stuff, stuff about us is true, maybe, just maybe, the Bible's description of God and who he is is true as well. Start with the stuff you can empirically test, you can empirically verify, and then move to the stuff that calls for some faith. That's what the angel does with Mary. If you've got a problem thinking you can get pregnant, just look at Elizabeth. She can get pregnant. If she can get pregnant, you can get pregnant too. If God can help her, God can help you. Now, it's at this point that Mary has a bit of a decision make. Because just like Mary knows that all this is crazy because virgins don't give birth to babies, everybody around her also knows that virgins don't give birth to babies. And so here's the thing. If Mary says, all right, sign me up. I'm on board. I can't wait to have the Son of God. Um, Everybody around her is going to be deeply suspicious of her. In fact, it's worse than that. If you go back to Old Testament law, you find out what happens to people who are suspected of sexual immorality. Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24, if a man happens to meet in a town a virgin who's pledged to be married, kind of like Mary is, she's pledged to be married to Joseph, she's engaged, and he sleeps with that virgin, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. You must purge the evil, Deuteronomy 22 says, from among you. 
Here's Mary. She's a virgin who's pledged to be married to a guy named Joseph. Joseph knows that it wasn't him. Mary has this story that basically says it wasn't anybody else either. It was the Holy Spirit of God. He's worked a miracle in my womb. People back then, they were not stupid. You see, for Mary to say to the angel Gabriel, sign me up, I'd love to give birth to the Son of God, also is for her to say, I'm willing to risk my life. for the mission to which you have called me. Now, is it just me, or does that seem like kind of a stressful first Christmas? <laughs> a woman who has to risk her life to do what is right by God. And so the question is, how does Mary respond? What does she say? Here's what she says, Luke 1, verse 38. I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me, Mary says, be fulfilled. Mary has issued a challenge and she takes the challenge. She literally risks life and limb to be a servant of God. That's the first Christmas, a woman who is willing to risk life and limb to be a servant of God. Now here's the question for us right here, right now, today. What are we willing to risk as servants of God? You know, this leads us to just a few quick lessons that I want to talk through with you in the few minutes that we have remaining about dealing with the present. Dealing with the stressors that come our way, dealing with the concerns that come our way, dealing with the worries that come our way. Because you know what? My guess is, as servants of God, we probably won't have to risk life and limb at least this holiday season. But there are other stressors. There are other concerns that can suck the joy right out of Christmas. They didn't for Mary, and it doesn't have to for us. So how do we deal with the present in such a way that is healthy? In a way that is kind of Mary-like and Mary-esque. Let me just give you three things to keep in mind as we wrap up. First thing is this. Um, to deal with the present well, you don't want to be surprised by surprises. To deal with the present well, you don't want to be surprised by surprises. If there's one thing that this story teaches us, it's that life can throw you curveballs. In fact, more than that, God can throw you curveballs. Things you think can never happen wind up happening. Angels come and visit 14-year-old girls. Virgins can get pregnant miraculously. God can intervene in our world. And it shouldn't be a surprise that from time to time you wind up surprised. And so here's the thing. Be flexible. Roll with the punches. Be ready to take on challenges that you didn't think you were going to have to take on. One of the things my son Hayden struggles with is reflux, which means that he spits up a lot. And you never know when it's going to happen. We call him our volcano because he's going to erupt, and he can't erupt at any moment. Everything may seem fine when all of a sudden he will be covered in spit up. And if you're holding him, you will be covered in spit up too. And so Melody and I have gotten into the habit of always having a burp cloth on standby ready over our shoulder because you just never know. We are not surprised by his surprises. You know what? Life can make a mess out of you in a real short order. Are you surprised by that? You just never know when you're going to have to take that unexpected trip to the ER on Christmas Eve. Or when a loved one's going to fall unexpectedly ill. You never know when that in-law of yours is going to decide they want to spend Christmas with you by coming over to your house by three, for three and a half weeks, even though they haven't told you until two days before they come, right? Life is full of surprises. Mary's spectacular at rolling with the surprises. She's worried, but then she also thinks through them. And we can do the same thing. Don't be surprised by surprises. That's the first thing I want you to keep in mind. Second thing I want you to keep in mind is this. Ask questions 
and get help. Another thing that I really respect about Mary is that when she gets this big surprise and when this angel visits her, and when this angel says, you know what, you're a virgin, but you're going to be pregnant by, by God by the, for the Son of God. Mary doesn't shy away from asking the angel for some clarification. She says to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Now here's the question for us. When your life gets, gets crazy, do you ask questions? Do you ask for clarification? Do you get the help that you need? You know, I don't know how many times over the course of my ministry I've had a conversation that goes something like this. Somebody comes up to me and somebody tells me, oh, so-and-so has been sick. And they're in the hospital. And things are not going well. And I'll, I'll become very concerned and we'll have a little conversation and I'll finally say to that other person who's just relayed me that information about that person, hey, ha- have they called anybody at the church office? Have they, have they asked for anybody to come over and visit? And they'll say to me, no. They didn't want to bother anybody. Folks, if you know someone like that, can I just encourage you to go up to them, put your arm around them, and in the most lovingly way you can say this, say, don't do that. Because when life gets stressful and when life gets hard, it's okay to ask questions. And it's okay to ask for help. We all need it. Mary's not afraid to reach out for it. She's not afraid to ask big questions. She's not afraid to probe the mind of an angel for a while. Are you afraid to ask big questions? To probe for help? Or are you too busy trying to be really self-sufficient? Ask questions and get help. That's the second way to deal with a lot of stress in the present. Third way to deal with a lot of stress in the present is very simply this. Be a servant. Mary says at the end of it all, okay, I may risk life and limb, but I am the Lord's servant. Okay, here's the reason being willing to be a servant is so important. When you are willing to be a servant, you wind up, instead of trying to control the present, you wind up living in the present. And there's a big difference between those two things. You know, several years ago, I had the pleasure of going on a mission trip to uh, a Native American reservation in New Mexico. And one of the things that we did on this mission trip was we put new roofs on houses that had been badly damaged by some hailstorms. Now, I will tell you, um, I have never put on a roof in my life. In fact, up to that point, I'm not sure that I had ever been on a roof in my life. Now, this was several years ago. Have I been on a roof since then? No. Did I put on a roof since then? No. This is not something that I do professionally. They gave me some shingles, some tar, and some nails, and they gave me a few basic instructions, and they said, go at it! Now, it was one of those funny things, because here's the thing. I was there to serve. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to put on a roof. But I figured that the people who knew how to put on a roof would show me how to put on a roof. I didn't have to worry about it. Was I licensed? No. Am I bonded? No. Do I have an experience? No. Am I going to be any good at this? Probably not. Does it really matter? No. Because they've asked me to serve, and so I'm going to serve. You see, all the responsibility for all that other stuff, that was taken out of my hands. I was asked to do a task, and so I did the best job that I could at that task, and my prayer is that it was a blessing to somebody else. I didn't have to control the present because I wasn't in charge of the present. I just had to live in the present. You know what? That was a great experience, and it also took a lot of stress off my shoulders. Because I wasn't worried about insurance and licensing and bonding and all of this other stuff that normally goes along with that roofing because I wasn't in charge of the roofing. I was just hammering shingles onto a roof, having a good time doing it, and it was beautiful there. Guys, when all you ever try to do is control the present, you're always going to be stressed by it. Because there's always going to be one more thing to worry about. There's always going to be one more thing to freak out about. There's always going to be one more thing to try to change. There's always going to be one more thing to try to fix. And you're never going to enjoy anything. 
But when you live life as a servant rather than as a controller, all of a sudden you can simply be present and say, what has been given to me to do, this I will do, and I will have fun, and I will have joy, and that will make a difference. That's what Mary does. She can't control it. She can't change it. She can't rearrange the plan of God, and so she does the only thing she can do. She says, I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever you say, I'm game for. May your word to me be fulfilled. One more thing, you know, um, part of what I like about Mary's response to this angel so much is that Mary is only doing finally what her son is going to do for her. Mary begins this pregnancy by declaring herself to be a servant. Jesus ends his life by declaring himself to be a servant. Philippians 2 verse 7, Christ made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. And being found in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. How did Jesus die? He died as a servant. How did Mary begin this pregnancy? She began it as a servant. You know, it's a funny thing. If there's one person who could have controlled the present, it was Jesus Christ. After all, he's not only the son of David, he's the son of the Most High. He's the son of God. He's omnipotent. He has power. But rather than trying to control us, you know what Christ came to do? Christ came to serve us. And because he came to serve us, he wound up saving us. And that's why no matter what we may face in this life, in this moment, in this, in this time, in the present, here's what you need to know. The future that we have is secure. Because we have a Savior who met us in this time to bring us into the next time. To usher us into eternity. And so no matter what the present brings, when we serve God, we trust in a God who also served us. And in that, in Him, we can rejoice. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servant Mary and we pray that we too would be servants like Mary. May we respond to whatever life throws our way. Instead of trying to control everything, may we serve everyone. Father, that blesses lives and when your son does it with us, it changes hearts, changes the world and saves us. We thank you for that service and so we pray that we may be servants. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. Walk with the light.